Hi everyone, I didn't hide my email address well enough and so someone found it and sent me a fascinating puzzle in the form of why the heck is this Rust program leaking memory? Uh, there's a lot going on in the code, but basically it just makes a big map and then it, it builds the reverse map. So it goes, instead of going from keys to values, it goes from values to keys. And because there might be duplicates, the, 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 the type we're actually building is a hash map from value to hash set of keys. So it's a multi-map because one value can map to multiple keys. So the first way of doing it is you get the iterator and you don't actually build the big hash map. You just have the iterator over the, the key value pairs. Then you extract only the part you want. And then we're in, inserting it into the inverse map here that we're accumulating into. So this version is actually pretty light on memory. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to build it and release. Uh, I have a htop set up here that is going to show us how much memory it's using. So if we run it, it's using 0% memory, which makes sense. If we use the first method to build this, this reverse map from the, our big set of pairs, it's generating 5 million random pairs and then it's building the inverse map. And you can see that memory usage went up to 1 gigabyte. All the pairs that have been generated here have been thrown away. We only kept these, um, this kind of array of U8s of uh, length 16 and 20, and it's all into, it's all put into the inverse map. There's a bunch of interesting things we can do. There's a bunch of commands. We can perform a malloc trim, which is supposed to try and reclaim some memory. Here it doesn't actually do anything. It stays at uh, one gigabyte. Uh, we can clear the accumulator, uh, which simply calls clear on the on the hash map here that we're building. You can see that it did not actually change uh, memory usage at all. But if we do a malloc trim again, you can see that it goes all the way down to uh, about half a gig. And then if you drop the accumulator altogether, uh, which is called reset, we can see what it's doing here. It's just creating a new hash map and that's it. And if you do that, you can see memory usage falls all the way down to like almost nothing. So that's what the first method does, which is the best method. We have this method here that generate all the, the same random pairs, but then collects them into a big hash map. So we make this big hash map here, and then we call iter on it. So we do iterate over the hash map, and then we do the same thing. We extract those, those two uh, U8 arrays here, and we insert them into the inverse map. Let's see what the memory is it for that is going to be. So first we accumulate. And we can look at memory usage here. It's going up. It's going all the way up to four gigabytes and then back down to three and a half. When this method is done running, it's, it's using 3.5 gigabytes. Then we can do a trim. And trim actually works very well. It, it, it makes memory usage go all the way back down to one gigabyte. So we have method one that never goes over one gigabyte. We have method two that goes to three and a half, but then goes back down to one once you trim. And we're going to go into what trimming actually does. And if we clear the accumulator and trim again, it also goes all the way back down to half a gig. So the first mystery here is we're clearing the accumulator. We're removing every entry in it. And then we're trimming memory, we're asking uh, glibc malloc to release that memory. And it's still using half a gig. What's going on? Well, it's because um, the, the map, the, the capacity of the map grows as you insert things into it. And when you call clear, it, yeah, it keeps the used memory allocated for future use. But then once we reset, it makes a new hash map with a capacity that's very small. And so it doesn't have all that backing memory here. So that's why it goes all the way back down to zero. So, so far, nothing's really mysterious. The third version is where the mystery lies. It looks a lot similar to this one. So first we build everything and we collect it into a, a big hash map. And then we iterate over the things and we invert, uh, we insert into the, the inverse map, but it doesn't call dot iter. You can see in the annotations here, these are actually just references to what's in the map. And it's interesting to see how it, how it behaves. I didn't predict correctly what would happen here without reading that comment. So let's, let's uh, see what happens. So we run it again, and then we use the third method, so this one. And look at the memory usage. It goes up to three and a half, and then back down to three. But then if we trim, not much happens. It goes back to two and a half. So this is the first uh, method. It doesn't collect into a map first. So you can see it goes up to one and then stays at one until you clear plus trim and then it goes to half a gig. If you use method number two that does collect everything into a big map and then calls dot iter, it goes all the way up to three and a half. But then when you trim, it goes back down to one. Clear doesn't change anything and trim goes back down to half a gig. 
And then this is the third method. Accumulate goes all the way up to three. Then you can trim to get rid of half a gig, but this is the sticking point, right? Why, when you trim after the third method, doesn't it go all the way back to one, like the others? It doesn't happen with a vector. If you build a whole big vector instead of a whole big hash map, uh, you can see the numbers here. So this is similar, uh, one, 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 and then goes back to half, three and a half goes back to one, and then two and a half, and goes back to one when you trim. So there's a difference here, right? If you, if you do it with a vector, it doesn't do that thing. So what is going on? Uh, and then just for fun, one thing I was planning to do is, uh, what if you use uh, je malogator? Je maloc, tu maloc, vous maloquez. It's actually worse. It's actually worse. I This is my go-to, like, oh, your, your, your program is not reclaiming memory. You should try using je maloc. It's pretty good. But here it's actually worse. It, it stays at three and a half here. Um, Okay, I guess it does go back to like 1.9, but here it stays at 2.1 instead. It's uh, not what I expected. For now, it's a mystery. Why does this version seem to leak memory? It, it, it keeps holding on to those 2.5 gigs of memory even long after this map has been freed. That's what's going on. This is not intuitive because when you're thinking about memory management in Rust, you're pretty close to C. Like, so in C, you call malloc and it gives you memory, and then you call free, you give back the memory, right? And so you would think that if you give back the memory, then the memory usage in H sub or B sub goes back down. But it's not that simple, because if you look at what it's actually doing, there's a thread cache, it can do a map, there's a, a bunch of different bins, there's fast bin, small bin, if it's large, it's, it's taking a moment to do some stuff, it's coalescing, it's same thing for free. If there's room in the thread cache, store the chunk there. If it's small enough, place it in the fast bin. If it was mmapped, you can unmap it. Blah, blah, blah. There's a whole bunch of things. It's not just, we have something, we've malloc something, we freed something, now we're not using it anymore. It's not just that. glibc malloc is not magic. Malloc is not magic. It's an allocator. It has to get big chunks from somewhere, the, the, the operating system, the kernel, and then it has to give them to the program when it requests allocations of certain sizes. And so let's see actually what happens here. The first thing we can try is memusage. So memusage is going to record allocations and it's gonna run a little slower than before, but it's built into uh, glibc malloc, which is the, the default allocator on Linux, most Linuxes. We get a bunch of stats, which is neat. The total amount of memory allocated is 4.8 gigabytes, but at the peak, we've only ever used 3.1 gigabytes. You can see how allocations fall into different bins. Trying to make sense of like where these allocations come from is not as easy as I previously thought. I was, I was thinking like 16 to 31, well, that's easy. Those, those are in that bucket, right? But I don't know when those actually would end up on the heap. So it's not that trivial, but we can definitely see that the dummy data here of site 512 is definitely in that bucket, 512 to 527. So this gives us kind of a bird's eye view of what's going on. And then we can also generate a graph. This is when we're collecting everything into the big hash map. And then we are iterating through the hash map and we are freeing stuff as we go, right? Because we have these items here, um, the big struct, right? Which have a vec. So we actually only use UID, but then at the end of an iteration of the loop, we dr this drops implicitly. So it frees the vector. So this is what we're seeing here. It goes down because all the vectors are freed one after the other. And then we have those big bumps here. And the way I read this is that this is the hash map here, doubling in capacity. And then it frees those vectors progressively. And it does so all the way up until here. And then the big drop here, I'm assuming is when we actually drop that map. But here's the catch with this graph. This graph is memory usage according to glibc malloc. So malloc, like glibc malloc, knows exactly what we've allocated and what we've freed, and this is what it thinks. It thinks that we've used at most three gigs and that we're going all the way back to, let's say, the, how much is this, to one gig. I wish uh, you could kill the process and have memory usage just um, show what happened until then. What if you call process exit, though? Let me actually try this. So this is the graph that uses return. And this is the graph that uses exit. So it thinks we have like one and a half gigabytes of memory used here at, at the end before we exit. So this is when it's done. So let's explain the graph again. So collecting everything into the map, 
going down is, is, is freeing all those individual VEX and then going up is the, the, the accumulator hash map capacity doubling. We can see what happens after we return, after we return everything drops. So it explains the initial drop is getting rid of that unused backing storage and then uh, the, little, the little slope here is getting rid of all those vectors like dropping them in place and then another drop is just getting rid of that, that backing uh, area that was used but is not anymore. Uh, so this is what we avoided by using std process exit rather than return, which is actually a nice trick. If you have a lot of data and you don't want to spend that time freeing it manually, you know, like exiting the process is going to clean up everything anyway. So you can just use std process exit and then it'll work, which is of course terrible advice if your drop handlers are cleaning everything up, but you should be writing applications like the world could end right now, uh, by which I mean the process is getting killed by OM or the, the, the hardware itself is violently shutting down. These things happen and you should design stuff to be resilient to that. So now we're done looking at graphs. We are going to be looking at syscalls. How is glibc malloc even getting memory from the, the kernel? Which that's a good question. So it has two ways to do that. And one of them is S break. So we're gonna actually, before we go into syscalls, we're gonna look at memory maps. So pit of memhog to find the, the PID. Okay, so these are all the memory maps of our process. So we can see that the, the executable itself is mapped. I have a whole series about that, making our own executable packer. It explains how executable files are loaded in memory and, and how it all works. You can see that a bunch of libraries that we need are also mapped in memory. So this is all file mapping, so they don't really matter here. And then there's the stack. And then there's uh, some syscall optimizations going on. Uh, VDS, so th those are both for like making sys some syscalls faster. And VVAR, I don't know what it is. And then heap. Heap is the interesting one. So it, it, ha, it's going to be a hassle, but I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to be entering numbers in like Wolfram by looking at this range here. If we subtract the end, uh, if we subtract the beginning from the end, uh, we get 135 kilobytes. And if we look in HTOP as how, how much process is using right now, it's about, it's in that area. It's 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 not much. Uh, and then if, you, if we accumulate using the first technique, let's uh, wait for it to finish. And we look at the, the heap again. Now the heap is about half a gig. Which is interesting because if we look at the memory usage here, it's telling us that it's using a whole gigabyte. So where did the other half of the gigabyte come from? And the answer, of course, is mmap. Uh, we don't only have the heap, we have this new little newcomer here uh, that's big and doesn't come from a file. And we have a, a, bunch, a bunch more here and here and here. So what we're going to do is I guess we're going to exclude uh, anything with the... Uh, yeah, and anything with the... Uh, yeah. Okay, so these are all the the mappings that have been done that are like anonymous memory mappings. They're not files, they're not the heap technically, but they are usable by our program. And let's see, these seem pretty small. You can see 1.55, 1.56, but this one seems like the big one. So we're gonna try and see how big it is. It is 612 megabytes. So there you have it. So there's half the heap is in heap and the other half, of our allocations live in that memory mapped area. And then let's see what happens if we clear the accumulator and trim. Let's look over here. The resonance set went all the way back down to five, uh, 586 megabytes, so half a gig. That area is still here, but if we look at the heap now, it's still half a gig. So we still have a mystery on our hands. Uh, because we still have this area right here and we have this area right here. So if we actually, if we wrote a program to parse the output of proc uh, pid maps and then show the size of everything, that would not give us what we're seeing as resident set size here. It would give us the virtual memory size. So this is, this is actually the answer to that mystery. Uh, we still have like 572 plus 612 and that is one gigabyte. And that's the virtual memory size. But the resident set size, which is what BTOP would show, by the way, 
Uh, we, can, we can check Btop, memhog. Yeah, 586. It's only showing the resident set size, which is why I prefer htop. This is interesting, right? This is another level of, of, of things. Because like we knew malloc had like bins, it's trying to reuse allocations if you allocate a bunch of, of stuff at the same size and then free them and then allocate some again. It's it's trying to reuse them. It, it put them in a th in thread cache or in a bin that it can just it just pick the, those uh, those items up and recycle them. And that would explain why memory usage doesn't immediately go down when you free. Because like, what if you need some object of the same size after? And this is another level of trickery where like, if we look at the at the the memory that's mapped for a process, it says it's one gigabyte, but then Linux tells us uh, through htop that it's only using half a gigabyte. So what the heck happens? So we have we have a bunch of different mysteries going on here with a bunch of different layers. And it's not always clear like how much memory is, is, is the process actually using. And it was actually not clear to me until I had to solve that puzzle. But yeah, let's keep going. The way that you change the size of the that heap thing we saw in the maps here, that one, is through the break system call. So if we do S trace and we look for the break system call, we're gonna see it happening a bunch. Uh, so let's do the first technique first, and you can see it's it's here it is allocating memory, right? You can see the numbers going up. Uh, it's growing the heap, just like growing the stack. But the growing the stack, you just have a max size, and you just have a pointer. You adjust it if you go over its sec fault, if you're lucky. And uh, growing the heap is actually telling the kernel this is what the the top of the heap is going to be now. The, the heap grows up. And so if we trim now, it didn't actually call break again. And if we clear the allocator now, it didn't actually call break again. And if we trim now, it actually did call break. So we can see how much it actually released from here. If we take uh, this address here and subtract the new address, assuming it grows up and it actually did free memory, we should see how much memory it freed. It freed 40 megabytes. But again, that's not what we're seeing in the resident set size here. It, it's, it's half a gig. It, it was a full gigabyte and now it's half a gig. So what the heck happened? Uh, well, it's because the, the, the second way you can get memory is by using a map, which is what we see here, those maps here. Um, and so we can... Uh, we can also look at syscalls and map and, and unmap to see what's going on. If we actually follow the, the order of the execution here, you can see at first it's allocating not much. This is the first allocation that JLPC malloc considers large, and so it doesn't go through bins and stuff. It just directly unmaps it. And you can see it goes 15, 30, 60, 120. It doubles every time, 240 here. Um, and then of course, because it's doubling every time, it, it, it it's like, less and less frequent. So we know with the M map in our log um, R4, we know that they're for doubling the capacity of the accumulator here, uh, but the values here are generated on the fly. So even though this allocates a new VEC on every uh, every item yielded by the iterator, it's it's also dropped as soon as like the, the iteration finishes, as soon as we move on to the next item. So why do we have small allocations all over here? Well, because we're, we're creating new hash sets, right? So these are like just all the hash sets we're allocating. So we are at the first technique, the, the most efficient one. We, we have one gigabyte memory used. What happens if we clear the allocator? Do we have any syscalls? No, nothing. What happens if we trim? Uh, it is, again, releasing a, a, a bit of memory through break. But again, I don't think it's enough. We can check. No, again, it's just 70 megabytes. Uh, this does not explain this. So how is it freeing memory if not through like making the, the heap smaller? It's not calling M and map either. We can see earlier that it's calling, every time it's, it's doubling the size of the map, it's first allocating twice the size and then unmapping the, the previous uh, backing storage once it's done copying everything, I guess. But here it's not calling M and map when we're trimming memory. So what's happening? Because that would be the way to release memory, right? If you're, if you're malloc, if you're glibc malloc, you're trying to release some memory back to the operating system. If you've used break to, to grow the heap, then you can use break to shrink the heap. That's one way. Or you, if you've uh, mapped a, a memory area with an M map, you can unmap it with M unmap. And the answer is you tell the kernel 
Because here's another thing we haven't really talked about, right? This is all virtual memory. The reason we can just make the heap bigger infinitely, kind of, is because those are virtual addresses. There's physical addresses and there's a translation happening. And things that are contiguous in virtual memory, we have a big block of heap, may not be contiguous in physical memory. They can be mapped anywhere. So there's fragmentation at that level too, which is interesting. Uh, but what that means is that even if I have a big block that we've unmapped, we don't need to unmap all of it. We can take part of it and tell the kernel, we're not planning on using this right now. So if this was associated with a physical memory page, you could, for now, release it and, and let some other process use it. Because like we're not actually using it right now. And then when you do use it again in the, in the future, the kernel has to go, oh crap, I need to actually um, make that available again. Map that to another physical page or something. It's, it's gonna be a page fault. And the way glibcy does that is with mAdvise. And so let's see if we can explain everything. Now I think we have all the relevant syscalls. So we're gonna use the first technique. Uh, so break is doing the small allocations for the hash sets as the values of the hash map. And then mmap is doing the big allocations for the, the hash map itself. And then if we do trim here, it doesn't actually do anything. And if we clear and then trim, Aha, it's doing exactly what I said. It's it's taking some, so it's actually annoying. You could you could write a tool to visualize all this. I'm, I'm kind of amazed nobody's done this yet, but like if you can intercept mmap and break and mAdvise and like look into the procfs, you could, you could visualize all this. It's just hard to do well because those are huge numbers, but you can see it's telling the it's telling the kernel I don't really need all of these and these are big regions. So if we do the the total of this, right, it's freeing all but like 320 megabytes just by telling it, hey, I don't need those. And then also it's doing this. So this is more like it now because like we have 158 megabytes plus 321. So that's it's freeing about half a gig. Right, this is what we have. We have this plus five, uh, however we have let 586. We're good, right? We have one gigabyte. So everything is accounted for. But now that we know how glibc is getting memory from the kernel and how it's giving back memory to the kernel, we can see what's happening with the, the second and the third technique. So this is what's happening with the second technique and I think it's really interesting. Uh, so here, it's collecting everything into the initial hash map. And you can see that it doesn't jump up, which is interesting. Like this is a, you can pause the video. Why doesn't it jump up? Because like it's collecting that whole iterator here, right? Into a hash map. And we've seen that as you insert elements into a hash map, the, the backing store is double in capacity every time it decides to. It doesn't. It doesn't need to wait until it's it's full, um, because of the way hash maps work. There's buckets, and you don't want collisions. So, like, if it's like eighty percent full or something, it could decide to just double the size, the, the number of buckets, and so we should be seeing it jump up, just like we're seeing it here. Right here, it jumps up, and this is how you know it's doubling the capacity. But it's not doing it here. So why? I'm going to pause for effect. It's for you to think. You can pause the video now. Three, two, one. Spoilers. Okay. It doesn't because it knows what the capacity of the map should be. Every iterator implements the size hint method that returns a lower bound and an upper bound. So uh, the default implementation just says the lower bound is zero. It could yield no elements at all. And the upper bound is none. We don't actually know uh, for any random iterator. We don't know what the upper bound is. It could produce any number of elements. It could never end. We don't know. Uh, but for a range, we do know. So we don't know the amount of steps between start and end. And so here we have the exact size of the iterator. So when we're doing map and then collect over here, uh, it knows what the capacity of that collection type should be, which is actually just hash map. So I've annotated the graph a little bit. This is what uh, technique two does. So it knows the exact size of the iterator. So it knows what the capacity of the regular map is going to be. So it allocates this exact amount of memory for the map. And this is, this is what we're going to need. But then the values are vex. So this is a bunch of heap allocations as the regular map is being collected, as it's being filled. <clears throat> as for the reverse map, we don't know its capacity in advance. So this is why we can see it 
jump up. It's doubling the capacity every time. You can even see that here it's over committing. It actually, it actually, uh, it actually shows up in the graph. It's allocating double and then freeing the, the old capacity. And finally, it's going all the way up to this, which is about one gig. And then it's dropping all those VEX from the regular map. So you can see it's going down steadily and then dropping the backing store for the regular map. And so it's jumping down and we're left with about a gig, which is what we have here. Here it is with the colors. I don't know if, if that's any better. It's it's hard to visualize this stuff. And I'm doing this without a script or like without any sort of organization. So hopefully this, this makes sense. So now let's look at what the third one is doing. So this is technique number two. This is technique number three. Uh, kind of the same thing is going on except not. Now we understand why there's a jump here. It's collecting everything into a big hash map from an iterator. It knows the size, so it's, it knows the capacity of their hash map. So it, it allocates everything in here. Then it slowly allocates those VEX that we're generating one after the other. And here it's done collecting into the, the regular hash map. And then memory just slowly goes down and then back up again, because as we're iterating through the map, the VEX inside the regular map are being dropped. It's not an iterator by reference. We're not going to be getting references to those VEX. We're getting the, the real thing. So these are being dropped as we iterate through them. And then the capacity of the inverse map is being doubled. So this is where we see those going up. Uh, but we know these are M map calls, so those, those don't really matter. Um, but here's the thing that's interesting. It, there's also small allocations going on here. So we have small deallocations, the VEX that were in the, in the original map. And then we have small allocations for the hash sets that are in the inverse map. And so this is this is what the graph is not showing. Like the line should be going up because of those hash sets, but because we're freeing memory from the VEX, it's it's and more memory from the VEX than we're allocating for the hash sets, it's slowly going down still, and then bumping up when we need to double the capacity. And this is exactly what the problem is. And it's very clear if we look at the syscalls. So I'm not even going to show uh, what the uh, the memory usage is. I'm just going to run one S trace and it's going to explain everything. So all those small allocations here are this line, this line going up. So we're doing small allocations for the VEX. So this is happening in the code. So we're still here, right? During that line, those, those this line going up is those break calls. So we're just making the heat bigger. And then if we keep going back down, here we can see it's suddenly doubling very quickly up in size. It's That's building the inverse map, right? It starts with a very small capacity and then it's doubling up a bunch of times. You can see it's going again from 15 to 30 to 60 to 120, to 240 to 480, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a bunch of unmaps as well. Um, some that are unrelated to the growth of the map. So like this one is just... Um, this one is the map doubling, but this one isn't. This thing is unmapped, and it is the, we can see that it's the backing capacity. It's, uh, where do we have it? It's here. It's hard to see. <laughs> it's a little red dot here. So it's it's dropping the whole map that goes in the, in the right direction, the original map, uh, because it's allocating here all in one go. It knows it's gonna be half a gig, and then it's being dropped at the end here, all in one go with M unmap. So, actually I lied, let's look at, um, Let's look at HTOP anyway. So now our virtual memory size is three gigabytes, resident set size is three gigabytes. Uh, what happens then if we trim? Aha! It is also using mAdvise with mAdvise don't need, which is telling the kernel, hey, we don't need these, but look at what it's giving it. It's giving it a bunch of 4K and 8K, and this is gonna go on for a while, actually. It's giving it a bunch of tiny blocks. Oh, the blocks are getting bigger. <laughs> so you can see the, the bins have been used a lot. Um, and then finally it's shrinking the heap a little bit. So that took, a, that took a while. The virtual memory size is still three gigabytes, but the resident set size is down only to two and a half gigabytes where it was one gigabyte before. And that happened because of those bins, because it's reusing memory as it's being freed. This is what everything boils down to. So on technique two, um, initially we have a bunch of pages that are not used at all. And then we fill the original map with a bunch of VEX. And so they just get allocated in order and whatever. We were not freeing anything yet. So it's just linear allocation. It's just filling up pages as we go. And then we keep all of that and we just iterate by reference over them. And as we do, we allocate all those hash sets, right? 
and then at the end, we free all of x one by one, that means that those pages can now be freed. If we tell the kernel we're not using any of those vectors here, it can say, okay, so those two pages are good. We can reuse them for other programs. And this is why we end up with only one gigabyte because the, all the hash sets are compact here. But with technique three, originally we have nothing. And then we collect everything into one big vec. And then as we insert the hash sets, we free the vecs. And so when those are freed, they're put into a bin that it can be reused whenever you allocate for a hash set. And so the hash set end up being all over the place. And so when uh, at the end we, we don't have any vex, we don't have as many pages that are free. And this is why it's, we can't reclaim memory here. And that's the explanation for the big mystery. And now the question is, could you do this better? Yes, you could do this better. Uh, there's a bunch of ways you can fix it. Uh, I'm gonna show you a, a dumb way to fix it first. If you collect those big struts in a bin, and then just let it drop at the end of the function, then you're not gonna see the same behavior. You're gonna see memory usage go way up, up to four gigabytes. But then if you trim, it goes all the way back down to one gigabyte. Because what happened here is that we kept those vex around, forcing the hash sets to be allocated uh, in a compact manner. They're all contiguous. And then we free all the vex at one time. And if we if we were looking at syscalls, we can see that it's it's advising huge chunks of memory that like we, we don't need anymore. And so the resident set size goes down, but the virtual set size stays large. Uh, this is not a very good way to fix it. Uh, this is a better way to go about it. And this is even better. Uh, so that was the best version all along, but the question is now, what do we do when we have fragmentation like we have here? And the answer is you can't really, when you do memory, like manual memory allocation, you can't really fight against that. What usually, ha what the, the, thing, the thing that I want to show off actually uh, is let, let's remove the, the workaround I had here. So if we accumulate once, it's going to go all the way up to 3.1 and then we clear and then we accumulate again. It's not like it's actually leaking memory. You can see, uh, look at memory usage here. We clear, we accumulate again. Now memory usage is stable at 3.6 gigabytes. And I can do this all day, it's not gonna go higher than that. And it's very inefficient, it's very fragmented, but it's not gonna go any higher because it's not actually wasted memory. It's just allocations that can be reused. They're in bins. They're available for who like whenever the next time you want to do a bunch of small allocations for those vex or those hash sets, and they're here. They're available. They're not. They're just not available to other processes because the the memory space of this particular process is fragmented. So one thing I want to make very clear is that this isn't specific to Rust. It's specific to any language that doesn't have a moving garbage collector. If you're doing manual memory allocations. The, the, the address you get back from malloc is the address of the allocation. It's never going to change, which is great because now you can store it, a pointer to it, and you know that as long as you don't free it, it's going to be valid, right? Uh, but then you have other languages that have references, and references are not necessarily guaranteed to stay at the same address. But the language runtime knows all the references that point to something, so if it needs to move stuff in memory to defragment the memory space, it can do that because it can also update all the references at the same time. C Sharp has a moving GC, so it can move stuff around for better memory utilization, like reducing fragmentation. And that causes problem when you allocate something in C Sharp and you pass it to a C library that assumes that the address of an object is never going to change. And so that's why you have the fixed keyword. So there's, there's not really, also defragmenting actually uses up energy. If all you care about is latency and you have plenty of memory, then you don't want to be spending time defragmenting when you could be spending that time just processing requests, right? It doesn't make sense. So it's it's always a trade-off and this is not something that's specific to Rust, but I thought this was a particularly interesting problem because it forces you to acknowledge the layers, right? You have Rust and you think if you drop something that it's freed. No, it's not because underneath Rust, there's the glibc malloc that might hold on to this just in case you want to allocate something of the same size soon. But then underneath that, you have the operating system that even if malloc tells like, I don't need this range of the memory area I've mapped, 
The US might not do anything about it because first of all, it doesn't have to. Uh, but second of all, it might be too small and like it might be fragmented enough that it, it can't actually free up a physical page. That was a very interesting um, exploration for me. If you want to send me similar questions, I'll set up a Google Forms and put the link in the video, in the description, everywhere. It's going to be everywhere. You won't be able to miss it. I can't promise I'll get to every one of them. But yeah, sometimes a question hides a bunch of interesting discoveries about how our brain system works. I, I wasn't planning on talking about that. And now uh, we just spent a bunch of time doing that. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, and take care. And bye-bye.